ambition is two dimensional to me. There's conventional wisdom, which is connects with the words like drive, like intention, like aspiration, um, like hunger. So there's sort of a, a, a conventional description that people use. Um, but for me, I, I tend to I tend to look at ambition. It comes from a higher purpose for me. Like I think I was. Um, one of the reasons I was born was to add value to people through inspiration and by example. So that feeds my ambition and I believe that I've been given some talents and that I've got to use those talents to enable the world I live in to be better, the people I interact with to be better or become better and to aspire to be better. I think there's also um, an ethical code that attaches to it. So. You know, I have an aspiration or I have a passion for ambition but it's got to add layers to your character not start scars to the people you interact with so um, there is blind ambition where people will chase great will pursue great for the benefit of themselves and advantaging positions they're in um, things they can achieve but for me it's got to be grounded in doing what's right and uh, making sure that um, you know, that great becomes the result of the goodness that exists in people between people and from achievements that that are made. Well, it's linked a little bit to my higher purpose really is that you give me a cause or something has um, personal meaning, you know, in it that's deep, then it'll get everything that I've got. You know, so it's not an ambition that is sort of look at me where I'm at. It's a, it's a quiet, volcanic, rising of things that looks to suck the juice out of every day to enable ourselves to achieve it and, and you know, the face of that becomes things like sacrifice, things like discipline, um, things like courage, things like commitment that get awakened with vigour when you know, that ambition button is pressed inside. Human beings have a, an intense search for meaning so you know, as you move through life, you're looking to get an understanding of why, and, and when the why is hugely strong, it becomes a powerful motivator and a driver for people, which can manifest itself in ambition and people rising to achieve things that they may not ordin ordinarily do. So I come from a family of six, uh, all boys, nine years between the six. I spent the first 18 months of my life in an orphanage, so I had a perspective where we had to work hard, um, we were driven, don't get me wrong, it wasn't a bad place, it was a good place, better than the option of being you know, where I could have been and, and I think that I had a perspective where I thought the world was made up of normal people and me and um, out of that came the challenges and, and as you achieved you, um, you became encouraged and you received recognition which you didn't ordinarily get so when you're deprived of something like that you chase it and so you seek it in more places. So I think the roots of my ambition come from that. I started playing sport, got good at it, liked the accolades that were associated with it, so chased it further so I could get more of it. It was a bit like filling a tank. Um, and, and, you know, I think there is a little, you know, there are people that influenced me along the way that, both within the orphanage and outside it, um, who presented lots of helping hands, which at the time you did not see. Um, the second part of what fuels my ambitions around, I love firsts, I love new horizons, I love breaking through, I love achieving things that people see, think can't be done. Um, so, you know, I, I have a, an eye for those challenges. And um, as I've got older and moved further in the space, then I try and make those those things. Um, I bring them front and centre more often than what I would done, have done in, in, in my early, in my early days. We we bloom where we are planted, and so we, we can't help where we are planted. But you know, wherever you're planted, you always give an opportunity if you can see it. And at the times you may not, but. You know, as the years have passed and I reflect back, I can look at some key influences that were quiet guidance, provided quiet guidance for what it is that I needed to do to achieve. People who inspired me along the way, so 
I can still remember when I was at a high, not a high school, a like primary school in Martin, which was where the orphanage was in Tutanui Road. And we used to walk to school, walk home, you know, you did work before, work after. And, but there's a teacher there by the name of Pat Hayward who was a, and I can still see his image um, appear just immediately to me. He was just, he understood uh, where the home kids got picked on and bullied by a lot of the other people because of the mere fact they were in the home. He had a sense of care and connection that was different. He'd quite often say, Gilbert, come with me. And I'd look at him and I'd get up, walk to the door, and he would go for a walk, take me down the footpath and take me to the shop and buy me an ice cream. Then, you know, I'd just have an ice cream and we'd walk back and no one would know. But he uh, made me feel special. Um, and, he, and he just understood without having to say anything. And, and there's been a lot of... Um, a lot of different people along the lines that have done that, a lot of them teachers, a lot of them coaches, um, that have influence um, and are very, very good at creating the environment that nurtures a sense of care. So, you know, he, he, he in particular stands out as a, as a special person that, that I remember that um, I could look around and say, you mean me? You know, so all of a sudden you had some sort of significance in the world as opposed to being just an extra that was deposited there to take up space, so you know they they were you know that, that, that's an interesting experience for me. Politicians, um, you know, some coaches and sports people who are, are riding and jumping over people just to advantage themselves. Some business people who will manipulate environments, manipulate people, manipulate situations to advantage the, the, the their positions, but. I call that plastic ambition because it can get brittle and when it, you know, it bends and, and, and it normally breaks, it's not built of strong stuff. Who is the most ambitious person that you know other than yourself? But one person came to my mind when I thought about that and it was, it was Sophie Pascoe actually, you know, the Paralympian. So why, why did she come to mind? Because it, it, um, her um, career as a disabled athlete has probably surpassed anything that she'd ever been able to achieve as an abled athlete. And um, having um, known her and watched her and seen what, how driven she's been to push herself to the um, nth degree to achieve and to be an example for those to follow is just a wonderful um, example. She's, you know, she's even now challenging the status quo, she's challenging the coaching structure, she's going over the world to look for ways that she can get that extra tenth of a second and so it's the relative nature of um, her pursuit of great, um, which is far greater than it would ever have been prior to her, her disability and you know so you know you talk to her and you listen to her and, and it's just nothing but unbridled drive to get the best out of herself to achieve and to be an example for those that will follow and that for those that are currently in, in, in the pot as well. And when you talk about how you create um, ambition and how you create drive and you know quite often it's a mindset thing and it's a mm. perspective that people have and I could say um, could say to a group of people in the room who might might have been in pursuit of a quiet life and you could say that um, Someone in your immediate family is was going to get very very ill unless you are the if you are the best person in this room today. Now that would shift your mindset, and it would shift your mindset because you've made it personal. Yeah. And so I think whilst you can have that the moment things get personal, um, you know then things can shift. You can be a meek and mild and quiet, but all of a sudden you can be the ferocious driven tiger. So. You know, whether it's a, it's a drive or it's a need that can get um, activated due to the circumstances that you're actually in. I don't think there's one big secret, but I think there are dozens of little secrets. Causes move me, um, people move me, um, passion moves me. And so those sort of things there can be activated in the moment and all of a sudden you can be trucking along and, and, and you can, you know, you can really really move in, in, in a space that that is derivative of that um, I, I guess the 
the, re the key things that really activate my ambition or my passion is it's got to matter today and it's got to matter to me or it's got to matter to someone that I love or care about very deeply then then um, all bets are off and it's it's in pursuit of pursuing something for the you know for the betterment of of that kind of like um, you know questions questions can move me what are the unfulfilled desire desires what in life um, you know has really really taught you things what um, what did I have down the, the things I've lived for the beliefs I have um, you know the lessons I've learned the failures I've learned from when I ask myself different questions like that that quite often can activate different ambitions to um, to look at lessons and look at opportunities for for advancement but in in the key for me is the bigger the personal meaning, then that, you know, that 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 really just really drives me to to chase great and to do whatever it takes to taste it. Would be would be the you know look I don't but the people say I'm an ambitious person you know some looking at me would probably say yes, um, others would probably say no. He's just utilising the talents that he's got. Um, what would I say? Probably I am. Um, I, I don't think I could I could live a quiet life. I think I'll work till the day I die, but I'll be pursuing something. You know, it goes back to that adding value to people through inspiration and by example. So you can't do that by sitting and you can't do that by waiting. You've got to do that by taking. So I'll be looking at opportunities to do that. Without discomfort, nothing moves. You know, like you can be in a status quo where things are going along and if everything's gentle and menial and mild, then, you know, that that is, is quite a lot. The moment you activate discomfort in here, then then people move. If I have an intense distaste for the status quo because I think I'll, it's always sort of, I always kind of like to ask people about, you know, if this is where you're at, what's next level look like for you? And to move to that, you actually have to have a high degree of discomfort. You know, and so when pain, you know, I love the quote from Muhammad Ali. He says, and they said, how many, how many sit-ups do you do? He says, I don't, I, I only count the sit-ups when they start to hurt because it's only when it hurts that it, 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 it become, becomes value. So, um, you know, pain is, you know, is is an unbelievable um, a bedfellow, I guess, for success because people who are training want to take them to that place and push through it. Um, people are experiencing different trauma have experienced it in different ways, but you know, having strategies that um, can enable you to navigate your way through um, around over there's all you've always got to go through it. But I mean, I kind of I've kind of learned to say the moment I get to the pain place, I kind of like it because especially in my in my game, if you're working with athletes and you take people to that and you're feeling that then they're feeling it the same so that's the space where great things happen so dealing to them in that space is really important so it's just keeping your mind back on process it's staying connected to the task it's actually delivering what's required in that moment and you know pain is endurable as long as you know that it will end uh, it's only difficult if you if it's not going to end so that's why you can go to the dentist and sometimes get an injection and sometimes not because you know that the drilling will end and it's okay. But, um, you know, I think those who have endured long and lasting um, periods of pain and their circumstances have contributed to that will realise that when you can no longer change the circumstances you're in, the only thing that you can protect is your own mindset and your attitude in that given moment. And no one can take that away from you except yourself. So there's a understanding and a discipline that exists in those moments to enable you to actually hold on and eventually navigate your way through them. So you mentioned specific strategies just before when you were talking about that. What's, what, what strategies would you use if you've got someone who thinks they can't go beyond a particular point and you think they can? Well, you know, like um, when you've got people that can't think uh, that they can go beyond, it's normally because their judgments entered the house. Right. So they're judging how they feel in a given particular moment, and the moment judgment enters the house, then it awakens a whole host of internal events because you start 
getting tension and anxiety because you, you know, you are um, you're measuring how you feel, and that then manifests itself physically inside your body, and all of a sudden, all the normal stress-related responses um, occur. So, in those moments, we've got to actually quell the judgment, and we've got to connect to the tasks and the things that we've got to do in that moment. So, our attention is taken to those things that we can control, and and we we are absolutely ruthless in ensuring that any time any judgment about how we feel or how it's going comes into the house they're smacked in the head and pushed back down again and it's just what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? Step by step. Step by step, task by task. You don't ask people how, you know, you know, how you're feeling and allow all that to awaken all that. You just say, how can I help you? What do you need? And you just keep pushing them so they, until they go through it. You don't need any softness to enter the house in those moments where people are pushing through barriers like that. In sport, and you've got that to go through now, you look at pain from a difference. So if I've got, I've had a tragedy in the family or I've had a you know, difficulty in life and that sort of thing and I'm experiencing the pain that's associated with that. Um, you know, all, all I know from my experience is that trauma intensifies pain and um, the things that um, enable us to navigate our way through it are normally time uh, normally good friends and family where we can have good put it or a good conversation with and but if only if only it went where you actually had intensity of the trauma was here the stress was there and low if only it was linear and it went like that unfortunately it doesn't it goes like this like that and so you can be several days or months down the track and, and you can get an amplitude you can get a wave that takes you right back to that particular point so I guess it's, you know, what I've learned for those situations is you've just got to help people ride the waves. They've got to become good surfers. So in those moments where that wave is high, that we can understand that this will pass, mm. is that favourite saying, and, and, and this too shall pass. And so it's not too different to the sports person pushing through something because if you have a structure to take your attention to, so you're not actually focusing on the future and how you feel or the past about how that is, um, and by getting stuck in those two dimensions, it just amplitude, amplifies the emotions that you're actually feeling. So I've got a structure that takes me. I probably want people to have a state change so they can get up, they can do something, they can take their attention to some other place and so that wave can lower. But still understanding that um, talking to people and processing the energy that's stored in the brain from those experiences is crucial in enabling you to pass it to move through. But, um, you know, so what's critical in that is the, is the understanding piece about what happens to me when I've suffered trauma and, and that, that understanding that I'm not abnormal, that it is normal. And then I can sit and say, well, I'm not losing my mind and this is not crazy that I'm going out here. This is just a normal part of the brain responding to trauma that, and things that you've experienced. And you've got to release the energy that's stored in. Right. And you know, most of the research will tell you that you do that by talking to people, and mm. and sometimes it doesn't have to go anywhere, but it's just you turn the tap on and then you turn the tap off. You know what what burns people, um, and it is a and we had it a lot here with the earthquake, is that mm. people were going through the day and the tap was dripping all day, yeah. so that they couldn't actually quieten down the thoughts. And but if you give people permission for the next ten minutes, let's talk about how you feel and. Everything, nothing's off the table. Cry, yell, pour scream, it out. Um, you know, smack things, do anything. Then turn the tap off, and then go on again. And knowing that you can turn it on again at a certain time. I'm dancing on a floor with some pretty elite athletes that are living in a world of high expectation, of high scrutiny, high consequences if things don't go well. So, you know, being real and understanding who they are and 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 and. and how they want to be in that process and how we can help them navigate that is crucial. And, um, you know, the more I've been in this game, the more, you know, you understand that they're just normal human beings and living in an abnormal world, which is, yeah. which is that, which is the bubble that is professional sport for a lot of people, you know, which is an ambition and an aspiration for a lot of people. And quite often when they're inside it, it freaks them out. But, you know, simplifying it and keeping them real and 
understanding who they want to be and how they want to be become crucial to, to them continuing the journey and, and again utilising the talents that they've been blessed with. You know, fear is interesting. You know, like what, the thing we've learned over the years is that you know, people you've got to embrace fear. Don't don't fear fear. Fear is just something that may happen in the future that hasn't happened yet. And you know, like you know, the the opposite of fear probably is courage, and, and you can't have courage without fear. But what we want to do is take people's attention away from actually being fixated on the fear, which is something that may happen in the future that hasn't happened, and bring them back to the present and say. One of, the, one of the key things we kind of like to do too is to sort of you know, really work strongly on the identity of the individuals that exist. So I always kind of like our players to, if you, you know, when you become an All Black, you cross a bridge and you're walking on this bridge, which is your experience as, as, as an All Black or as a professional um, rugby player or sports person in this sense. Now, that bridge only has one plank, and um, that one plank is them as an All Black and they get their identity defined by themselves as an, inter as an All Black. When that wobbles, they lose or don't get selected, it'll tip them off that bridge and their life will come crashing there. So rather than having one plank, well, I like to work with the athletes to make sure we've got plenty of planks. So there's me as a father, me as a partner, me as a son, me as an uncle, me as a mate, me as an All Black. So if they're on that all black plank and that wobbles, they've still got these other identities that actually give them stability in the moment to to ride that particular journey. And and um, you've just got to feed those identities right through. So spend time when you're in the all black environment, connecting with your loved ones and keeping that plank strong. So um, who am I and how to be becomes a very very important language. And you know my. my my, as I've been in, this is my 18th year in this role, so I've been with the team for a good deal length of time, and my, you know, my aspiration is that when the people leave the environment, when they finish life in this bubble, that they're good citizens, because they're going to spend more of their life outside it than outside it than in it, and we ain't got that right yet. You know, a lot of people have looked at what we've done and they're following what the All Blacks yeah. have done in terms of the you know, the legacy book, which pretty well climbed inside our Hits. environment and told the people the what, but not the how, which is a good thing about it. But I mm. mean, you can't lose the the um, avenue for, or the vehicle for some people that may have been titillating or on the edge of those things and not allowing that environment to be the reason and the fulcrum for them changing. Mm. Mm. You know, like we, we are, it's well refuted that we don't have we have a no dickheads policy but we also have an eye to say can we move this person yeah and yes they have all this talent and all their skill set and there's a line that they cross where you go that's it but there must always be a twinkle in the eye which says but what if we could and, and i don't think you know sport and should be holier than now and so mm. we only take yeah the whole yeah and we, you know, otherwise I would have probably missed out on opportunities because of, you know, it took me a long time to grow into myself because of my experiences. Luck will be inevitable. You can have good luck and you can have bad luck. But what is most important is what you return on it. So I might have had some bad luck in my life, but I wanted to make sure that I get a, you know, a good return on it. And too many people don't get a good enough return on the good luck that they get. Bad luck in our game when you lose and you you're not selected causes shifts in people in a different way um, and forces a different form of introspection and scrutiny. Sometimes when you win and things are going easy, you don't. So your trajectory of improvement's not as great as what it would be as if you're under the pump and you think so. You know, kind of like you know, in, in your life, what's your return on luck been? Has it been high? Has it been average? And what's been pivotal in ensuring you've got the best from it?